Hey everyone, this is Lee from Smart Excel Tools LLC. A few people have been asking me about my labor scheduling tools, and so I thought I'd do a video on how to do a basic optimized labor schedule. And it's pretty easy, we can do it right in Excel. I used to be amazed at how much money I could save organizations just by creating efficient staffing models. I stopped keeping track when the savings from my labor project passed $100 million. I would argue this is a classic Lean Six Sigma problem. You may not hear it come up that often within Six Sigma specifically, but really we're trying to reduce variation in the form of excess capacity and or unmet demand. Ideally, labor would be available only when needed. My approach to this is very repeatable and scalable, and I'm going to show you how to set it up right in Excel. This is a basic version, but when I approach these problems, I, especially when they're more complex, I use linear programming models and sometimes machine learning to come up with optimized schedules. We're not going to go to those types of tools here, but uh, I'll get you working with the basic version and you can expand it yourself. So let's set up the basic tool in Excel. I'll show you how to do it. You can replicate this, work along with me, or you can uh, take notes and do it again, do it yourself later. But the basic idea is you have sort of three, really you have sort of two matrices, right? So you have your incoming demand, right? So if you're you know, a production environment, you have orders or something. Or if you're a customer service environment, you have customers coming in, whatever the demand is. And then you have a capacity, which is obviously what you can handle, so what you can create. So in a production environment, it's you know how many widgets you can build. Or in a customer service environment, it's how many customers you can, you can process. Um, etc. You know, there's a lot, a lot of different uh, situations. So the way to set these matrices up is um, you have a, so you have your demand, right? So I'll show you how to set up one of these matrices. So I go Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, you can use whatever word you want here. But this is how I put them. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And then I put the hours down to the side. I think this version of Excel will let me just, yeah, here we go all the way to 23. So that's 23 is 11 p.m. In, in military time. Zero is midnight. That's what the, the basic matrix will look like, and we'll make several of these. So that's our demand coming in. We've got our capacity. So we need another matrix for that. And then what we've got is the mismatch. So once we know our demand, and our capacity, we're going to have a mismatch between the two, and that's how we're going to figure out if we're getting optimal or not. So, there's a couple ways you could do this, but let's just right off the bat with these absolute values. So, what we're looking for is to minimize the, the total distance from perfect, right? So, we think of that in absolute values. So, you'll see more what I mean when we build this, but for now, we're just going to put ABS here and have the formula for the difference between the two, paste that down, and now just to show you how this is working, um, let's make this a little smaller so we can see it better, just to show you how this works, if you have a demand for 10 widgets or 10 customers or whatever it is that need to be processed in this hour, and you have the capacity to handle 5, then your mismatch is 5. Right? Vice versa, if you have a demand of 5 and a capacity of 10, then your mismatch is 5 again. You know, these are two different situations. One is you have extra capacity, which is wasteful. The other is you have uh, excess demand which is uh, not necessarily wasteful, but it's you know, caused problems. Like you may need to run overtime to, uh, to, meet, that, to meet that demand, etc. cetera. So, um, <clears throat> so let's put in some demand numbers here. Then we can start to figure out how we would understand how to build these capacity numbers in here, right? So let's just say, make something really simple. Let's just say in the first part of the morning, that's what you need. And it doubles. Just totally made up numbers. So you need 15 here. Peak, 
peak demand at night, and then say you go down to nothing here. Completely made up. <coughs> and let's make these a little easier to read. So, I can change this color. I like to put input cells as some variation of blue, so that's what we'll use here. Just paste over the formats. These are not input cells, these are calculations. I like to use a different color for that. Typically I'll use some kind of uh, yellow or something like this kind of color. So whatever works for you, but I suggest that you stick to these types of, whatever your format is, I, I suggest you just stick to that throughout the entire tool. <clears throat> now, so right now we've got these as input cells, right? So the idea would be that, hey, we have 10 people working here, five people working here, six people working here, but you can't really schedule that way in most cases, right? And that also is assuming that one person can handle one widget of demand. That's unlikely. So let's do it this way instead. We'll turn these into calculated cells instead. And then we'll come up with a couple other matrices that give us what goes into here. So we can put those in a lot of different places. I'll just put them below it to make it kind of obvious what they are. So for this one we'll have, actually let's, let's use the blue one because they're inputs. So this will be, um, we'll call them FTE, you know, employees or whatever you're scheduling, okay? So those inputs would go here. So now this means I've got five employees scheduled here, five machines or whatever it is that you're scheduling. And then you need another piece to figure out the capacity, which is their productivity. Um, a lot of different terms you can use for this. Productivity is maybe not the best in some environments because it might mean something else, but that's the term I'm going to use. And really what this means is is uh, how many widgets per hour each employee can handle, right? So I spelled it wrong. That's right, productivity. And what this means is, in this scenario at least, that a one here would mean that that one can handle five widgets per hour. So what does that mean? So up here in this formula, we need to say the number of persons scheduled times their productivity. That gives us the capacity. So where are we at with this now? We're saying that capacity is made up of the number of employees scheduled times the productivity per employee, right? In this case, I'm just saying widgets per hour. It could be customers per hour or whatever it is. So now what we do is we have these three inputs. So we have the demand, and that can be a complicated thing. You know, you have to figure that out, what your demand is that's coming in. A lot of environments are pretty predictable, but a lot are not predictable, so you have to figure that out on your own. Too many different variations to come up with it here. Um, the number of employees and their productivity. So now what's wrong? So now we have this number of employees, but again, we can't really schedule, we can't really say, hey, I want one on the clock here, five here, five here, ten here, right? The way we schedule employees is we have them scheduled for, you know, five-hour shifts or eight-hour shifts or whatever. So, and in this scenario, we're just going to limit it to the eight-hour shift, five days a week, two days off type of employee, sort of the classic full-time employee. There's a lot of different kinds of schedules that can be worked out with this type of model, but um, that gets a lot more complicated. And um, so I want to show you the simple case and then let you run with uh, coming up with more complex versions when those are required. So now what, what do we need to get this? We want to turn this into a formula also, because really it's going to be made up of something else, which is this right here. This we're gonna call this start times. Change this to an input color. Right we're gonna 
put some formulas in here in a minute, which are going to lead to our scheduling. So now what this means, let's put, let's put some comments here. This is the number of FTEs starting in this hour. So what, what does that mean? So I'll give you an example. If I put a one right here, that means that one employee starts at midnight on Sunday morning. Since we're talking about, in this scenario, eight hour shifts, that means that that's gonna result in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Did I get an extra eight in there? I did. Uh, or an extra one in there. So that means that this one right here should translate into ones in each of these hours, right? Because they started at midnight, but they work for eight hours. The reason why we're setting it up this way is that that way we can just put our inputs in, like, you know, one here, one here, one here, instead of trying to figure out, you know, how many hours there are in here and what that totals up to, blah, blah, blah. We're going to use a formula to do that. It'll be a lot easier. So let's figure out how to do that formula. So how do I get this to turn into ones along here? So how would that work, right? So it's a little difficult to explain. It's better, it's easier to show it. So if we put a couple of other scenarios in where we have some other people starting here, two there, we figure out that we kind of want to work backwards, right? So, and here's why. If I go here, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and I say, how many people are working in this hour? It's really the sum of these numbers that started either on this hour or in the hours before it, all the way back to eight hours, because they worked for eight hours. So think about that for a second. What am I saying? I'm saying there's five people on the clock here because five people have started their shift within the last eight hours. And their shifts are at least eight hours, or their shifts are eight hours long in this scenario. So there will be five people working here. So that, I hope that makes sense. And that's easy when you do these rows down here, right? Let's throw a few other numbers in here. I'll just make some random ones so that we can look at random scenarios. Let's actually keep it, keep it lower than that so it's easier to understand for now. Turn these into values. Okay. So what happens when we have the situations where we're where going eight hours prior would take us sort of off the map of this matrix, right? We have to start adding in the stuff at the bottom. I should probably put a few ones here too to show how that works. So how does that work? So now we need to know the sum of these seven. There's seven there, and anybody who started on the mid or in the uh, eleven o'clock hour on the prior day, which is this one right here, right? I messed up the formula here. Let's get that right. So it's these seven and comma this hour right here, right? What about the other one? So this would be these six comma and these two right here. You see how this is working? This would be these five and these three. quicker ways to do this, but um, just to keep it simple on how this is working, I'm going to work, work through it manually. These three and these five. These two and these six. This one. Oops. So now if we kind of like walk through these, hit F2 to look at where the formula is pointing, we can kind of see how this works. All right? 
this section shrinks, this section grows, and it's because we're using more and more of the prior day. So that works for the situation where the week flips over. What about the following day on a Monday? It doesn't really work the same now because if we do that, we're going to be pointing off the map again. So we've got to redo these. So now, same kind of thing, but we're going to be pointing to these seven and this one right here, etc. So now we've got all of these formulas that work correctly. Right. Now we can copy these ones over. So if you copy the whole, don't copy one and copy it throughout. <laughs> Copy all uh, seven of them, and then paste formulas in here. So now all of these should work the same way because we didn't have to flip over the week, right? That'll work. Yep. Good. Cool. So now what do we have set up here? We have this situation where we can plug in the start times and how many people start in those times, and it translates into the number of people working at any given time in the day, at least based on eight hour shifts. So now what's missing? This would be if we only worked one day a week. <laughs> so we've got to make this work for five days a week, right? So now we're realizing, oh, we've got to modify this. So, and I'm building you up through how this works so you kind of see. So really, what is this? What would this mean? Well, really, this would be the sum of all the individuals starting within those hours on any of the previous four days or this current day, since they have two days off in a row, right? So five-day work week. So we've got to figure out a way to make that a formula in here. So luckily, all we, all we need to do is sort of extend our reasoning with this formula here. So let's think about this. So... So really what we're trying to do is figure out how can we plug in a 1 here or a 2 or whatever and have that translate out into the entire shift over the week. So right now we've got this number of FTEs starting in this hour. I want to sort of turn this into the number of FTEs starting in this hour. Let's see, number of FTE with, with this as their first hour in the work week note, but it's summing up what we're saying. So how do we do that? So now, let's, let's get rid of some of these to make this clearer to look at. Let's think about sort of the easiest case here. So, in fact, let's just get rid of all of this. We can use the same kind of logic, but we're going to extend it. Now let's look at the easiest case, okay? So we want to know how many people are working in this hour right here. Well, it's anybody who's, whose work week started either on this same day in this hour or the prior seven hours or on any of the five, or sorry, any of the four previous days in those same hours, right? So this is the sum of these five days, five, for these eight hours. There will be 29 people, based on these work week starts, there will be 29 people working at this hour. And luckily, that's pretty easy to do for anything up to the point where we, where we start flipping over on the weekend. So, so how is it? let's see what happens here if I do this. So am I still on the map? I'm still on the map there, okay? And I can go quite a ways up before I think to here. Let's see if that's what it is. I think that's right. Not one more even. So these ones are easy. These are all quote unquote on the map. So now we're getting into the situation where we get off the map, like we did before with the with the day flip over, but we've got to take into account the full work week again. So how would we do that? Let's start easy. So let's look at this, this one right here. 
So this is going to be kind of similar to this, but that takes us off the map, right? So where should these five, where would those be at? Well, we would take those and we'd move those down to here. We're taking those from the prior days. So really what we want to do is take that top off of that block of formulas and move it to the prior days, two, three, four, five. So now what we have, this is one shift, this is one shift, this is one shift, etc. So we've got the flip over taken into, into account, the uh, flip over between the days. That will work for, I think, these two. Yep. Then we end up off map again. <laughs> now let's work up a little bit. So we want to do the same kind of thing with these other ones. So this one, we need to incorporate this part down here. So, we change this to be these. Right? Now we can, we saw before we can copy that over one day. It still works. Oh, made a mistake. Forgot to remove the top part of that formula block right here. So now we have it. All right? I'm just going to continue through and do the same stuff for the other ones. I'm going to use a little trick in here to get these right. Do it quicker. I'm just going to lock this down. And we're going to change this to 57 and lock that one down. Oops, 56. all these correct in one swoop now. Let's see if that worked. Yep. So all those are right. Now if we were to extend that formula over again, we're going to be off map, quote unquote again. Alright. So now we're off map over here. We don't want to do that. So what do we do? Where is this at? over here. So we've got to take that into account now. <laughs> so let's lock these down again. Let's see here. So this will be 33. Let's so lock that down. We want to go down to 56. So we'll lock this one down. And these absolute references. Um, but we don't want to start in T. We want to start in And ultimately, we can't go farther over than you, so we also want to do that. But we also got to count this cell here. I'm going to do a little trick here where we use the same cell, but we're going to lock it down. I think this should work. Let's give this a shot and see what happens. So, looks like it worked. Now let's see if we can extend that over to be included in the other cells. Might need to make some more changes. Let's see here. Yep, we ended up off map up here. So let's fix that, how that works. So for this one, what we want to have happen is to not go past U. So now we're staying on U. And we're going to have to lock that. Right. And for these ones, same thing, U, we've got that locked. And this one's good. So this one, we want to be able to go over past. Or we want to lock down. Let's see, that's what we want to do. So we want to lock down. It's AA. So we use absolute reference there. Let's give that a shot and see what happens. So if that's working for this day. Now let's try it for the other days and see what happens. Let's just do one at a 
time. Looks like it did what it was supposed to do. Oh, wait. No, it didn't. We're not including these right here, right? So we've got three days here. We need two there. In fact, missed it on the last one, too. We've got one, two, three, four. We should have included these. So, let's get those in there. want these. And we want to lock it down this cell here. So, it can't be more, or it can't be uh, higher up than 33, and it can't be farther out than, than AA. So, we'll lock this cell here. Should, that should work. Let's take a look and see. Looks like it's working for that day. Now, let's try it for the, the prior day. So far, so good. That yeah, looks right to me, including all the correct days there. Cool. So now we can just take this, I think, and paste it over. Let's see what happens. Looks like everything's correct. I, I uh, highly suggest you actually go through and make sure these are right. So see, there's one that's wrong. off the map down here. Did something wrong there. That's okay, we'll just manually fix it. So, looks like what we need to do is get rid of, oh, we need to have an extra day here. Let's just make sure that's right on the other ones. Two days off. Two days off. Okay, good. Two days off. Oh, I know what's wrong. We need to just get rid of of this whole, that's what happened. We went off map here and it anchored to this. So that's okay. We just need to get rid of the use for that day. Nope. Wrong, wrong ones. This one right here. That should have it, right? So got our block of eight hour, or seven hours and five days here, and then our each of our hours over five days split here. Okay, we're good. So now if I copy this down, let's just check it out. Looks like it works. Good. Okay. Now let's get the rest of them in here. They might be a little different. Let's see. So we're not going to need to have the flip over on the days on these ones, but we do need to include five days worth and the week flip over. So how do we do that? So let's see. Let's start off by copying this one over and see what happens. So it's including these. We don't want that. We want to include these. Right? So let's just say this has to be at U. And we don't, oops. We need the absolute reference on U only. And then we also want to include these days, right. and we need these to be absolute reference at AA only. Let's give that a shot and see if that worked. Looks like it worked. Alright, checking all the way through here, skip down, and see if it worked. And yep, looks right. So now what if we copied this over? It's still working. Like it still worked. Let's try copying it down. Yep, we're getting the right stuff. So let's copy these all over, and I think we're going to encounter an error over on the end. These are what good, but when we hit here, oh no, these are right. Yeah, these are right. Yep, because it includes that day, the prior days. Yep, we're all set. So let me, um, I'll just highlight each of these, I'll just look, uh, go through each of these formulas if you want to slow down the, uh, the video and, and copy them or make sure you've got them right, feel free. Um, but I'll just do this quickly, so that one.
everything else on down. If you copied this whole row and put it down, it'd be fine. So where are we at now? So we have a setup where we can put in the start time for a work week. So let's just check if this is working. Throw all those out. We have, let's say we have one employee only. That employee starts Sunday morning at midnight. Well, we would expect to see them for five days for eight hours on each of those days starting at midnight. Well, look what we have. What is this? What does this total up to? It totals up to 40. It's a 40 hour work week. So that's good. Let's throw in a couple of other scenarios here. Let's just put somebody who starts here. Right. They work on these hours and these hours. So it totals up to 40. Looks like we're good. So, so that's the basics of setting it up. Now it's up to you to figure out what's the best scheduling to hit these capacities. And remember, we've got this productivity factor in here too. So that comes from measurement and understanding your operation. But for the sake of simplicity in this one, I'll put an easy, an easy uh, scenario in where, scenario in where um, each employee working for one hour can produce two widgets or handle two customers or whatever your operation is uh, requires. So what we should see then is that one employee here should translate into 40 hours across these hours on these days, which should be the equivalent of 80 widgets across those same days and hours. Got the 80 right there. Everything seems to be working. Now you see you need five. You need to cover five, not two. So we have this mismatch of three. So let's, let's clear this up a little bit just to make this an easy scenario to understand. So if we start one, if we only have one employee that starts here, we're going to have this mismatch here. That mismatch is 110. And we're going to keep track of that. So I like to put totals on these. Not tota, total. <laughs> so these are the daily mismatches. Um, cells will be colored like that. We'll just change them back to clear. And then there's going to be a total of those totals. We can either do that by summing this line up or we can sum these up. I prefer summing all these up. This is our total mismatch. This is 190. We want to try to get that number as close to zero as possible. That's how you optimize this. So let me show you what I mean. So if we get rid of this employee, our mismatch is now 230. We add that employee, and the mismatch is 190. If we add another employee in that same spot, our mismatch comes down even further. Why? Because they can handle two each, which gets us to four, which is almost enough to cover this demand. And so we have mismatches of one in here. We also have surplus time right here, which is contributing to this number as well. So this is where you get into balancing acts. So, the thing with the thing with uh, these types of scenarios and doing them in Excel is there actually are a few tools in Excel where you can where you can uh, run little optimizations. So you can use Solver, and that's probably what I would do. Um, you could also use which is something which is a little more simple called. Uh, let's try to find it. move these things around on me. Let's go to what if analysis. We do a thing called goal seek. The idea is to set this to zero by changing, so I'll set that to zero by changing this cell. It's That's not going to happen. <laughs> this is probably fail. Let's see it's going to fail. Just keep on running. So, what you probably need to do is use Solver, which I'm not going to get into that here. So let's look at uh, other scenarios. So let's say we had demand down here for, let's say, two. And let's start with what we had here with the three. All right? Okay, so three got us 180 there. What happens if we put four? 
it gets worse, so we leave that at three. What happens if we put two? It gets it gets better. So we're gonna leave that. What about one? Worse. So we're gonna leave the two. Alright. Let's put one here. What happened? 170. That's worse. One here. Stayed at 160. So that's a useless. Ah, there we go. We got better. What if we put a one here? Even better. A one here. Even better. Alright, this is one way to go through an optimization on this. This is very uh brute force, and you could write a macro to go through this, if that's your thing, but um, you can also write formulas, so I've done labor planning tools like this where you just actually calculate which of these would be the best place to put one of these, or uh, put an individual, and then run a macro to go through and just do them all and check the math, um, but yet at the most basic level, you can just try to plug them in one by one, or you can use the, the solver like I pointed out before. So, give you a little extra taste there of how to do this, um, other than just showing you how to set it up. So I hope you take the time to go out and check out Solver or other optimization methods, uh, and those, you'll find those very helpful with this type of thing. Okay, so what if you have a, a, a scenario that's much more complicated than this? Like you have employees that um, they only work for four hours, and you have some that work for eight hours. And, you know, the way you'd have to do that with this is to maybe unstack these so that all the matrices go top, across the top and then below that you have like the four hour version and then you have like maybe like you know the two hour version but then what about if they work on different days of the week like they work on some employees work on one tuesday wednesday some work on monday wednesday friday saturday you can have a whole lot of different scenarios and it becomes really kind of unwieldy to have to stack a whole bunch of different scenarios and add them up together so so luckily the smart six sigma toolkit now includes a basic, what I call a basic labor planning tool, what other call, others might call a little more complicated <laughs> labor planning tool, but um, help you improve quite a different scenario. So it's right here, labor planning tool, it's under improve. Labor planning tool, i pop up on my other screen for some reason, let's bring it over. So let's see how this works. So you can see, a, it's the same kind of idea, I've got these matrices here. Um, there's a lot of hidden math going on in here. Let me shrink this down a little bit. So for this one, what you do is use this matrix at the top, and you say, okay, we have something missing there. I have an employee that starts at, say, 5 a.m., and they work for, say, eight hours. And actually, let's say they start at midnight, because then it'll be like the one that we're looking at on the other sheet. Let's say they work five days in a row. So you put ones here on all the days that they work. And you get sort of like we had on the other sheet, you get this total here that adds up to 40. But what if they only work four hours? Well, this takes care of that. It says they only work four hours. Okay, well, what if they only work Sunday, Monday, Wednesday, Thursday? Well, we can get rid of this. We see they only work Sunday, Monday, Wednesday, Thursday. So now what you can do is you can have much more, um, much, much better matches to the demand coming in. So let's grab this same demand. If you have that kind of ability to schedule employees that way. All right. So in the productivity per hour, we use that same two that was on the other one so that we're consistent. In our comparison. Okay, so now we could say, and plus we, I like to do this uh, chart here so you can sort of see the mismatch, right? So you can see the blue line is the capacity, the orange line is the demand. What we want to try to do is get these two lines to be the same. If they're identical, then you would have zero for your mismatch. So if we look at this, we see there's red mismatch here, so we might try to do something to accommodate for that. So if we're allowed to schedule four-hour shift employees, we might say, oh, look, we need scheduling all through here, so maybe we start them at 2 a.m. So up here, we'll put 2 a.m. On the number of hours worked, we might put four. And then days worked. You know, hopefully you can have pretty good flexibility with that too. But let's say we can work them five days in a row here. Let's see, we reduce that mismatch right in there. 
we'd go through and do that for all the days. Um, again, you could use some kind of solver scenario here. These cells are unlocked, so you can set them to be changing cells. And you can come up with something that matches. You can see what we're trying to match here. Something that matches a lot more closely and save quite a bit of uh, waste. So again, if you want that uh, version, you know, please, please feel free to download it. The downloading is absolutely free. It's actually absolutely free to use. Uh, it's donation based. It's a smart. And again, it's called the Smart Six Sigma Toolkit. It's available at www.smartexceltools.com. That's it for today. I'd love to hear how you've approached and improved scheduling in your operations, or if you have an interesting problem you need to address, let me know in the comments, or reach out to me at lee at smartexceltools.com, or through the website at www.smartexceltools.com, or of course you can uh, connect with me on LinkedIn, I always like that. So thanks everyone, and again, until next time, remember, excel intelligently.